I was reading the Daily Independent at five minutes past nine precisely when Captain Con Colbert knocked at my door and inquired for me. Good morning, Potter. Get to Emerald Square. Well, Con Colbert told me to be there by ten o'clock, but when I got there, there was nothing but a guard. I felt humiliated, and I was walking around the place in full military attire with nine but with a gun and uh, five hundred rounds of ammunition, marching around like an idiot. But the others did come eventually. It was now nearing 11.30 and over a hundred volunteers had by this time assembled, including officers Eamon Kant, Cattle Brewer, Liam T. Cosgrave and Conk Albert. The order to move off was given and the parties marched to take over the Dublin Union, a Marble Lane distillery and Jacob's factory. Although there were, had been a good deal of skirmishing around the whole Union area, it seemed quite evident that the sniping and the war of the Hope Rifle Fire left the military, who had already quite a number killed, that they did not feel quite sure of their position. On the following day, Tuesday, a determined attack was made from the inside of the Union grounds. The attack was repulsed and several soldiers were killed. Around the nurse's home, there was a British soldier who basically was in the middle of sniper fire from everywhere. He made a dart for the carpentry shop, hopped into a coffin, pretended to be dead and was carried out with the mortally wounded. Wednesday was the day of calm before the storm. On Thursday, some of our men had just partaken and others were disturbed from their midday meal, but the call of enemy attack to your guns came from Cosgrave, who raised the alarm. The attack commenced at about 3 p.m. and continued for close on four hours, and it was estimated that at least 600 military took part. There was little or no plaster left on the walls of the rooms. Furniture was broken, and there was only the strong granite stone walls that could withstand the machine and rifle fire. Well, I remember the fighting being very intense in the Norse's quarters on Thursday. William T. Cosgrave's brother getting shot through the throat. It affected the man greatly. We were crawling through around it and around his dead body while bullets were flying overhead, four inches from our body. We were lucky to survive that day. On Friday there was a lull in operation. And on Saturday morning, we heard that the surrender of the volunteers was contemplated because on Friday a petrol shell attack had struck the roof of the GPO and the whole building burst into flames. On Sunday, Thomas McDonough, accompanied by a priest, brought the surrender order and we walked in file to Patrick Street and onwards to Richmond Barracks. I only wanted to do a man's part and thank God I lived to do it. I joined the volunteers in 1915. I went up to Larkfield and saw McDonough and Seamus Murphy. And I asked them did they intend to fight. He told me that they did. I said in that case I wanted to join. On, on Tuesday morning I had all my men up, the, up at daylight. There were windows on both sides of the building in which we were. I got the volunteers to barricade the windows with, with books. The next thing that happened was that there were, there were a shower of bullets coming in. They were coming in crossing over to the other place and some of them were hitting the ground before they went out and some of them went out into the street. There was a fellow right beside me and he wanted to return the fire. I said, no, let them waste their ammunition. There was a man called Martin O'Flattery and he said he would like to have a shot at them. So I said to him, very well, but before you have a shot at them, put your hat on top of your gun and push it easy. And while he was doing that, two bullets went through it. Now, said I, if your head had been in the hat, what would have happened to you? He still has that hat. When we came to the end of the building, there was a small little house. And we had to get a ladder to get down. And when we got down, I took off my coat. I was sitting down having a smoke. I heard more sounds. I opened the door and walked out with a pipe in my mouth. And there were about 30 British soldiers outside. I acted without knowing, brought up the gun and fired. I went back and shoot, shouted to my men. They were attacking very heavily. We got down the stairs and the bullets were coming in and over us. I had a young man, chap called Joe Horan and I, and I said to Joe, go in and ask Kent, is this a surrender or is it, is it a fight to a finish? He came out and said, yes, it's a fight to the finish. During Easter week 1916, I held the position of storekeeper in the South Dublin Union. 
I remember Easter Monday 1916. At about 12 noon, I saw a group of volunteers enter the grounds by the front gate under Commandant Kant and Liam Cosgrave. Kant asked me for supplies. He first asked me if I had any corned beef or bacon. I told him I had not. But I could give him supplies of anything else he required, such as tea, sugar, condensed milk, butter, etc. He handed me a written order for these provisions. On Monday afternoon, sometime after, the British military entering by the back gate at Kilmainham, I had occasion to take supplies by horse van to various departments of the institution, having obtained permission to do so from the volunteers. I wore a white coat and carried a white flag on a broom for identification purposes. The lady, who was now my wife, accompanied me. We got through without being fired on and delivered the supplies to all the compartments concerned. I may mention that this is not part of my normal duty, but seeing that there was no one else available, I had to do it. On my tour, I saw that the British forces were in occupation of the canal wall at the back gate of Kilmainham. On that same evening, Monday, I was making another journey with supplies, my wife, who was to accompany me, went into the nurse's home and informed Mr. Cosgrave what we were about to do. He said it would be all right, but warned us not to give any information. Can't get my wife a written message to the commanding officer of the British forces within the Union asking for a ceasefire for 20 minutes while they, the volunteers, were collecting the dead and the wounded. My wife delivered this note to the British officer in command and his reply was, No, they shot our major and we will give them no quarter. He tore up the note. My wife reported back to Kant and told him what the British officer had said. The volunteers cheered when they heard the news. Throughout the week, I kept on supplying, on my own behalf, provisions to the volunteers. As I had to employ a man to deliver the supplies, I could not say whether they were ever delivered or not. In later years, Mr Cosgrave confirmed that they were. On Easter Monday morning, I received a mobilisation order about 10 o'clock. We marched via Basel Lane and James Street to the South Dublin Union. And as we were entering it, G. Murray ordered us to erect a barricade at the front of the church, which was opposite the main gates. Uh, a man approached us, who I understood was Dr. McNamara, uh, upbraided us for the damage that was being done. And, he, and G. Murray came out and said to him, My dear man, calm yourself. We're only defending our lives. The doctor then replied to him, Who the bloody hell has gone near you? And he, walked, he approached his way to the office that was beside the main gate. And I watched him through the open window of the office, and I saw him lift the telephone receiver. And I thought that was like oddly strange, so I immediately reported it to G. Murray. And he immediately sh shouted at me, stop that man quickly, he's telephoning the enemy. So I doubled it to the office and ordered him to drop the phone. He had my order at first, whereupon I uh, repeated myself in a more louder and menacing tone. Uh, while giving him a light prod with the bayonet into the shoulder. He then dropped the phone and he turned to me with a very serious uh, tone in his voice and said, I will get your name. He left that sentence unfinished because but at this time I was already joined by other volunteers. Well, I asked the volunteer to our right on to where any information to where the enemy's location was and he indicated that they were directly to our front and this was confirmed immediately by the enemy after I started hearing bullets whistle close to my ears. Once I heard a voice say, are you all right there, Sergeant? And the reply was, yes, sir, but we need some on bombs, sir. So I instantly thought of grenades and that's when I started to get worried. But then I looked over to look at French Mullen and he obtained one fuse grenade and he lit the fuse and he leaned, out, leaned over the, um, the ball straight and I was very uncertain of his name so I uh, like went prone behind a dustbin and as the grenade went off and it exploded but I don't know which side of the barricade it exploded on so. We heard a voice that like said, uh, that's it boys, I'm done, Re retreat to the next building and as everyone was, was uh, retreating uh, through the thick uh, cloud of plaster dust, we saw the figure of Cattle Brewer and met, I, or, I got some of the other volunteers to run downstairs and bring him into the kitchen just to see if he was still alive or not. Well, uh, a number of our garrisons were already in further wall barn operations and I was aware that very, very well directed and concentrated fire was being maintained against our windows at the back of our building. This was effectively preventing us from applying to the fire. In a short while, the interior of our building had a dense cloud of plaster dust. 
I adopted an alien position behind a dustbin, so in my rifle on the window. As soon as I saw khaki clad figures uh, across my scope, I immediately opened fire. I then shouted to my comrades, uh, informing them that the British were at the front of our building. When we surrendered, the Irish volunteers had to take off all of their equipment, so their bandoliers and their Sam Brown belts and all of their arms. Um, for us, however, it wasn't necessary, and some of the volunteers actually gave us some of their own um, personal uh, guns to, to hide in the hopes that we wouldn't be arrested or searched. The British officers asked us had we any arms or ammunition. We said no, though a few of us had small arms that some of the volunteers had given us to keep safe for them, thinking that we would not be arrested or searched. When we, we were marching towards Richmond Barracks with the British soldiers alongside us, we were very grateful for their presence because um, the separation women were beside us a lot as well, shouting obscenities and, and, and threatening us. Um, we, were, we did feel quite intimidated. We spent the night there, not sleeping, as we had no mattresses or any sort of sleeping accommodation. During the night, the sergeant asked us if we had any guns on us, as we would be likely to be searched by the soldiers at some later stage. We foolishly said we hadn't, thinking we would be sent home and could not hold on to them and not be searched. When he had gone out, Miss McNamara, who was in charge of us, became a bit worried about the position. Eventually, she decided we would say the rosary for guidance as to what we should do. We decided to hide them, um, and we decided to put them up the chimney because there was little ledges uh, in there, so we, we stuck them up there, hoping that maybe at some point we might be able to come back and get them, but as it turned out, it wasn't possible. One Monday we were lined up and our names were called from a list that one of the officers had. After a period of awful suspense, he announced that the persons whose names he had called were to be released. I can't say whether all the women prisoners' names were on that list, but certainly all our garrison were on it. Before we left Kilmainham, an English sergeant who worked in the office and was very sympathetic told us that he had something to give us and that if we came back the next morning he would give it to us. The sergeant gave us the letter from Con Calvert, his watch and his prayer book. The prayer book was for Con's sister Lilla and the sergeant asked us if we could deliver it to her. We undertook to do so, although we did not know her address at the time. Con, with all his intimacy with us, spoke to us very little of his family. She eventually came to our house and we gave her the prayer book and all Con's clothes. My dear Annie and Lily, I am giving this letter to Mrs. Murphy and she will not mind to hear what is happening and she will get you girls to pray for those of us who must die. Indeed, you girls give us courage, and may God grant you freedom soon in the fullest sense. You won't see me again, and I feel it better for you not to see me, as you'd only be lonely. But now my soul is gone, and pray God it will be pardoned all its crimes. Tell Christy and all what happened, and ask them to pray for me. Goodbye, my dear friends, and remember me in your prayers.